Hi, this is Peter Schwartz again with a good friend and collaborator of many years, John Hagel from Deloitte. Uh, and uh, John is the leader of a team that has been developing an amazing new vision how organizations and the economy are going to work. And that's what we're going to explore for the next half hour. So welcome, John. We're happy Thank to you. hear you. Ha have you here, and thanks for joining us. Uh, before we get into the, the, the substance of this, tell us a little bit about the Center for the Edge. Sure. Uh, the Center for the Edge is a research center based in Silicon Valley. I was brought in seven years ago, and I brought in uh, John Seeley Brown, who was the head of Xerox Park. For a good friend decades. of us both. Yes. Uh, and we're co-chairman of the of the Center for the Edge. Basically, the charter is identify emerging business opportunities that should be on the CEO's agenda but are not, and do the research to persuade them to put it on the agenda. Why the edge? <laughs> Uh, the edge uh, takes many different forms, first of all. We think about edges in terms of geographic edges, emerging economies, demographic edges, new uh, generations coming into the workforce and marketplace, and technology edges, new generations of technology. And our view is that those edges, it's on the edge where you start to see innovations emerge and new opportunities emerge first. So if you focus on the edge rather than the core, you'll have an earlier view of what's going to happen to the core over time. So that's what we're going to explore, <laughs> is that movement from the edge to the core. Now, you know, you've written, I, I don't actually know how many books. How many books? Seven books. What's the same as me. I've got seven <laughs> books as well. But mine have been all over the place. You, you've had a kind of consistent theme of looking how, at how this technology is changing, how organizations work, how the economy works, how society works, how people live and, and work day to day. Uh, you know, before we get into the kind of where it's all going, uh, you know, you've seen it develop now yeah. over a, uh, a very long time, as uh. we have both. You know, we have a similar <laughs> amount of hair. Uh, so when, uh, you know, you, you think about this history, just reflect for a moment on, you know, is it close to what you thought was going to happen? Is it very different from what you thought was going to happen? How has it played out in terms of the kind of vision you were thinking about 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago? You know, obviously, along the way, some... Uh, some detours and surprises, but broadly, I mean, the first book I wrote that really focused on technology and business uh, was Net Gain, which right. is back in the late 90s. And it was given to me at Davos. Well. That's where I got, I handed it out to everybody. <laughs> it was in my hotel room at, at, in Davos. That's where I first read Net Gain. And, and the key theme of the book was the notion that you're going to be misled if you just focus on the technology. It's all about how technology connects people more effectively. And ultimately, that's the opportunity that, that emerges from all of this. And I, certainly, that's been a consistent theme in the work I've been doing over a couple of decades now, is focus on the people enabled by the technology rather than getting distracted by the technology itself. Well, you know, that's very much in keeping with what Klaus Schwab was saying as well, you know, the human dimension, the emotional dimension, and so on. And, you know, uh, when you think about it that way, uh, we really are in a radical new era in that respect, in terms of connectivity and so on. You know, we're always connected, always available. When Klaus and I were walking on stage a few minutes ago, uh, just as we were about to walk on, his BlackBerry uh, buzzed, and he had to quickly answer a message, Reminds right? Me, yes, turn mine off. Uh, and <laughs> I handed it to his lovely wife, Hilda, yep. uh, and said, okay, well, before we go on stage, I, I got to answer this message, because he, too, is always connected, always available, always on. Absolutely. You know, it, it, did you imagine we'd have all this stuff in our pockets and our ears and everywhere all the time? Oh, yeah. I, yeah I, to me, it's, it's actually, I mean, I'm an avid reader of science fiction, as, as uh, I know you are, and, you know, I've been consuming this for a long time in terms of the impact of connectivity, and I've just been waiting for more and more of it, and I don't think we're anywhere near the end of this process. So. It, it, I asked my son not long ago, who's you know a, a junkie for all this stuff, you know, so which science fiction world are we in? And he said, <laughs> Neuromancer. Neuromancer, there yes, you go, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, every science fiction fan knows Neuromancer. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Neuromancer or Diamond Age, I'm not sure which Well, one. you know, that, that, well, it's interesting. He, he was asked recently what book affected him more than anything else, and he said Diamond Age. Yeah, it okay. had a big impact on me, too. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah, Neil Stevenson's amazing. Yeah. 
So now let's get into the, the, the heart of this. You know, you've been developing a, a sense of how organizational structure will change, how those structures will interact with other structures in different ways, scale changes, role changes, all made possible by new levels of intelligence and connectivity in the economy. Uh, the organizations that are emerging, like Uber, is one that everybody knows. Right. Tell us, what do you think is going on here, and, and, and what does it really mean? Huh. Um, you know, it, it, there are many different layers or levels to this. At, at a core level, one of the things we focused on is just trying to understand uh, the impact of technology on business. And it may be a bit heretical in this, in this context to our audience, but um, one of the things I talk about is the dark side of technology, which is um, the notion that the impact of these global digital technology infrastructures is to systematically reduce barriers to entry and barriers to movement on a global scale. And that increases pressure on, a, on an ongoing basis. It's a long-term process. We don't see it leveling off at all. We don't certainly don't see it easing up. We're under more and more pressure as individuals. I mean, no matter what your credentials, no matter what your accomplishments in this rapidly changing world, you got to keep learning and keep getting better at what you do. You can't just relax. And well, you know, yesterday Gavin Newsom was here and he was talking about what happened when he opened up the city to Uber. Yeah, right? yeah. And he said 68% fewer cab rides, right? Yeah. Those that cab talk drivers about don't pressure. like that much. Right. right you know. <laughs> no, so, so that's the context that we take this in. And the paradox, and I love paradox, the center for the edge is a paradox in itself. But the paradox for us about technology is on the one hand it creates mounting pressure on all of us and it's a continuing process. On the other side it creates expanding opportunity. And the big question of whether we're under pressure or in an opportunity area is how have we changed our mindsets, our practices and our institutions. And that's ultimately going to determine where we fit on that spectrum. And it's in that context that we've spent a lot of time trying to understand First of all, just the structure of the economy. I mean, there's been a huge debate in the internet world about, on the one hand, a camp that says, we're all going to fragment into e-lancers or independent contractors, we'll loosely affiliate when we need to, but basically corporations are dinosaurs, they're going to go away. And that's high fragmentation. On the other side, there's an opposite camp which focuses on network effects and platforms and ecosystems and says, actually, this is a winner-take-all economy. We're going to have a few very, very large companies that basically create and capture most of the value. Everybody else is going to be marginalized. The question is, are, either, are both of those true, or are, are, which one is true? We believe, actually, elements of both are playing out that in the economy. That sounds right. You have Amazon and you have writers who can, uh, uh, Amazon is a giant organization, but you have individual writers who can now get published because of Amazon who couldn't before. Yes, and right. even earlier with eBay. I mean, right. eBay was a, a catalyst for a very large number of home-owned businesses, people who had hobbies and did things on the side, finding out they could actually make a pretty decent living because they were connecting on eBay with customers around the world. Sure. My wife is they an were. eBay maven. She loves eBay. <laughs> but look, I had the experience, you know, uh, I have, uh, I've, like you, I've written a bunch of books. One of them was very successful, Art of the Long View. My yes. publisher loved it. Hugely successful. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it sold a lot of copies over a very long time. I wanted to update it. I wanted to write a, a new version. Ah. And so I went to my publisher, hey, I, I want to do a, a new version. I said, no. I said, what do you mean? Does this one keep selling? I said, why should we do a new version? <laughs> Don't mess with so, it. So <laughs> what I had to do was write a new version and self-publish it on Amazon. It's called oh, Learnings it. from the Long View. Because my publisher wasn't interested because they were still making money on the old one. Interesting. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as an author, that was very frustrating. So, you know, I love Amazon as an author. It gave me a vehicle to publish when my publisher, you know, and they're in the middle of this battle right now with authors and Hachette and so on. Right. Uh, I, I have a lot of sympathy for Amazon on this battle, I must say. You know, for the unpublished author, it's actually a pretty good place. It, yeah, it creates huge opportunity for, for the more fragmented players the individual authors and people who just have expertise in a very narrow domain. I was with Hugh Howey, the science fiction writer recently, right, yeah. who wrote Wool. How did he get started? He published on Amazon. Now he's become a global bestseller. But before, right. you know, he was writing basically a blog that turned into a, a sort of a novel that then became a huge success. Right, Wouldn't right. It happen? So 
you know, how do you play in this world? How, how do we think about this structure? Well, you know, it's really interesting because most of my clients with Deloitte are large Fortune 500 companies not around the world, not surprisingly. Um, they're uh, under huge pressure for growth. Investors are saying, where's the growth? Um, and our, our message to them is, look, you know, strategies of position are back. It matters where you're standing in this global economy. If you're standing in parts of the economy that are going to fragment, good luck. There's no growth there. In fact, you're likely to be increasingly pulled apart into smaller and smaller entities. So avoid those areas. On the other hand, there are areas that are going to concentrate and consolidate very dramatically. That's a very powerful platform for growth. If you so give us an yourself. example of each of those. Yeah. You know, something that's fragmenting and something that is really consolidating. Sure. So actually, you can think about it in the context of cloud computing. On the one hand, uh, our general view is that parts of the economy that are going to fragment by, and varies by industry, but broadly, are product innovation commercialization businesses. So if you're coming out with new software, uh, in, in the tech industry, that area is fragmenting dramatically. What was required to enter the software business 20 years ago, it's a fraction today sure. because of cloud computing platforms. Right. I don't need to invest in all those data centers, I just got to come up with a really interesting application with functionality for, and it can be a very narrow niche because then I can use platforms to connect to find the buyers the users of that application. Well, we've got a great example literally right behind us here. <laughs> I mean, we were sitting in front of the uh, Salesforce Expo, and back there are a couple hundred companies built on our platform, all innovating, all creating new kinds of potential because there is a software platform on which to build. Yeah, so broad message, and, and we're seeing this play out over, over industries. So it started in the digital areas of media, uh, video, books, um, all music. The, all, music. All those product categories have been going through a process of fragmentation. More and more ability to address niche audiences because the means of production are now affordable by virtually anybody. We moved into application software with cloud computing. That's falling in. Look at 3D printing in physical space. Great example. Real opportunity there to see fragmentation around very niche-oriented product innovation companies that are quite small, down to the level of an individual or typically a small business. Um, so you want to be very cautious if you're a large company and look at the product economics in your industry. Are the means of production democratizing? Are they becoming more broadly available? If they are, there's a very high probability of fragmentation in those industries. And on, conversely, you want to look at the parts of the industries where concentration and consolidation still matter. So again, cloud computing, look at the infrastructure as a service business. Right. Very scale intensive. There aren't a whole lot of small Two niche or three players. Years, AWS, Google, yeah. that's about yeah. it. You know, and over time, it's going to consolidate even further. So that's an area if you want to grow. But a key message for us is that those parts of the economy that are going to provide growth have network effects. So if you are not, and scale effects, so if you're not an early entrant and building position in those parts of the economy, it's going to be harder and harder to come in afterwards. So give us an example of a network effect that might play out here in a kind of big way. Sure, well, I think part of it is the, uh, I, you have both scale effects, so infrastructure as a service. The larger the data centers, the lower the cost of processing within the data center. It's very hard for a small company to come right. in. Network effects, I mean, you can think of Amazon, you can think of eBay as classic examples, where the more participants you have on that platform, the more valuable the platform becomes to all the participants. And again, it's harder to come in at a later date and say, oh, I'll, I'll become an online book retailer. Okay, <laughs> good luck. <No> more. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's a very good point, that is that the network effect is when there's mutual benefit. For every, you know, the, the more people come in, the better the whole is, as opposed to, you know, the old world where actually everybody was taking a little bite from everybody else, and the more players meant I had less. Yeah, no, it's a, it, in economic terms, it's moving from a zero-sum world to a positive-sum world, where again, everybody benefits the larger the whole entity gets. So, 
Well, you know, that, that's a very key idea, this notion of a positive some world. Because I think out there right now, there's this sense that it isn't that way. Right, right. right. So that there are more losers than there are winners. Yes. Do you see it the other way around, that there are going to be more winners than losers out of this game? Absolutely. I mean, over time, I, our belief is that part of the value of these platforms and networks that are emerging to help connect its customers with vendors, its funders with companies that need funding. But in all of those areas, one of the key attributes today, I would say most of them are very transaction oriented. It's just you know, connecting a, a person with something they need and deal done, move on. The real opportunity we see in those kinds of businesses is how do you scale and accelerate learning and performance improvement of all the participants? So feedback loops that help every participant see broader trends and patterns, get ideas for how they could be more effective in terms of participation in those networks and platforms, that's the real opportunity. And in that world, everybody does benefit. I get better, faster as I participate in a larger platform. So, you know, look, we've got a real live controversy going on right now. Airbnb, Uber, right? So you're Hyatt or you're Marriott, you're looking at Airbnb or you're a taxi chain and so on, and you're looking at Uber. You know, how do these guys, the old guard, compete with the new guard? Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, one of the key views we have is that all large companies are going to face a key choice back to the most basic question of what business am I really in? If you think about most large companies today, they have three very different business types embedded within the company. On the one side, there's what we call infrastructure management businesses, high volume, routine processing kinds of activities. For example? Could be a factory, could be a logistics operation, it could be a customer call center that's doing very routine customer support kinds of activities. High volume, routine processing. Second kind of business is product innovation, commercialization, coming up with new products and services, getting them into market quickly, accelerating adoption, extending the life of those products. So that's a second type of business. Third type of business is a really interesting one because it's often misunderstood. We call it a customer relationship business. And everybody says, oh yeah, customer relationship, we do that. But this is the notion of being a trusted advisor based on increasing knowledge of individual customers, that you become proactive in giving advice and helping. Health insurance company, for example? Could be, I mean, I would say today, not very, not very much. I mean, they've got their own agenda. Part of the issue, I said trusted advisor. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you have to convince the customer that you're on their side, yeah, yeah. that you're not just trying to push to get lower costs. So, so or, what's, another, what's an ex another example of a trusted advisor in this case? Well, in this point, at this point in the uh, evolution of all of this, the trusted advisors tend to be for the very affluent. So oh, yeah. a personal f wealth management advisor, a medical concierge, a personal shopper, all of those people have invested a lot of time and effort to get to know you as an individual customer and connect you with the right things. And they're proactively recommending. They're not just waiting for you to say, I need something. Uh, the problem, I mean, for that is that it has been largely restricted to the very affluent because it takes a lot of time and effort and money to get to know you sure. really well as an individual. Now, with the digital tools and platforms that are available, we think there's an opportunity to take this mass market. Why not become a trusted advisor to everyone? I think that's a really big deal. I mean, part of the vision that we have is this idea of intelligent context through intimate computing, right? Yes. That the, the system will know so much about you, it can always deliver the intelligent context you need at any moment, any situation, whatever it is that you're doing. Yes, no, exactly, and that's the, that's the opportunity. Now, I would say all large companies today actually have all three of these business types tightly embedded in their company. They've got infrastructure management, they've got product innovation, commercialization, they've got this customer relationship business in a very prehistoric or primitive form. These have very different economics, very different skill sets, and ultimately very different cultures in those three business types. So will the companies break up? Yes. 
So we're, we've already seen the, what we would describe as the first wave of this, which is the movement towards um, outsourcing of infrastructure management businesses, right? We're all familiar with contract manufacturing, handing off logistics to specialized providers, uh, getting um, uh, customer call center operations done by specialized providers. So that's well advanced. I mean, there's still a lot more to go, but that, and I think it's a recognition that that's a very different kind of business. We're not world class, we, a large company, diversified, are not world class in these areas. We ought to hand it off to somebody who is world class. So that's first wave. Second wave, we believe, is the pulling apart of product innovation, commercialization, and customer relationship. And that those will become two very focused business types. Part of it is because, again, back to this issue of trust. If I've got my own products that I'm trying to sell you, and I tell you, no, I'm really your trusted advisor, you can count on me. But what if your competitor's products are the ones that I really need? Now, I'm not going to believe that you're going to actually point me to the competitor. So there are issues that I think force a pull apart those two business types. And again, it goes back to this notion, we're in a world of mounting performance pressure. If we try to keep these tightly bundled and compromise on the what's really required to be world class in each of these, we're going to lose relative to those who are much more focused and world class. And the big issue, again, if you go back to this issue of fragmentation and concentration, is that of those three business types, infrastructure management businesses, a lot of economies of scale and scope, those are going to become very concentrated and consolidated. Customer relationship business, we believe very concentrated and consolidated over time because the more I know about you as an individual, the, the broader picture I have of you, the more effective I can be in advising you. And the more other people I'm advising, the more helpful I can be to you as an individual because I can start to see patterns and recommend things to you based on that. So huge economies of scope in that business. The one that's really challenged is the product innovation commercialization business. Because again, if the means of production are democratizing and becoming more broadly available, we think that's the business type that will be most likely to fragment. And again, if you're a large company, you'd probably not want to be focusing on that business type as your core business type. Well, look, let's take an example. I, I saw something amazing about two weeks ago. The first 3D printed car. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> by a company called Local Motors. Yeah, you, you Local Motors, yeah, I know. Right. Well, yep. Yeah, so you know, they, at MIT, they actually printed a car. I show a picture of it in my talks. Um, and, you know, the paradigm case of the industrial economy was the automobile assembly line yes. and the automobile company, Ford, GM, etc. Uh, these were the giants of the industrial era, vertically integrated, uh, you know, and Ford went all the way from the mine mouth all the way to the final car and the dealer, right, at right. one time. Right. So they, they don't, they, you know, iron, coal, all the way to the car. Well, if you were the CEO of Ford, who we had here a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> what would you do in this era? How would you, you know, you, you, you see this 3D printed car, you see Tesla, a new startup company, suddenly is the hot car company. What, 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 what do you, how do you think about, you know, this massive capital you've got deployed, these re models all over the world, the relationships you had over generations with customers? How do you think about it then if you're the CEO of Ford today? Well, first thing is to really think about it, which is important because I think many senior executives look at these kind of edge initiatives and say, well, that's just, that's a tiny piece, you know, it's never going to yeah. take over the mass market. I would say you've got huge assets as a large company, and I won't pick Ford specifically, but just to generically. Any very large company has huge assets in terms of brand relationships, physical assets. The key question on the table is, again, going back to those three business types, over time, do I want to focus on infrastructure management? If that's the case, to take the car example, maybe I could provide my factory capability to support this new very interesting, oh, interesting car idea. design. Right. Um, I've already got the scale. This company is going to spend a huge amount of time trying to get scale. I can provide it now. On the other side, it could be customer relationship business. I have a lot of customers today. I have relationships with them. By and large, not all that great because I'm still trying to shove products at them. But I could start to build that trust and that relationship and, again, connect 
these people more effectively, these customers more effectively with the relevant vendors or products that, that matter the most to them. So I think it's a process of just figuring out of the assets I have, which direction do I want to take it? And over time, again, our advice is, as, no matter how focused you are on products today, think about pulling back from that part of your business and how can you connect to more uh, segmented or, or niche product uh, vendors and help them to connect to the marketplace because that's going to fragment in most most markets or industries. So, you know, the, the car companies have been talking about, for example, selling mobility as a yeah. service as opposed to a thing called a car, yeah. right? So we have things like Zipcar, et cetera, which have begun to emerge and all of that. Do you think that is an avenue for these guys? It's potentially an avenue. I mean, it's a huge shift from where they are today. Sure. Um, I, but I think one of the interesting things that that model uh, offers is if I want to be in the customer relationship business, having visibility on what that person's doing with the car, where they go, how many times they go there, the patterns of movement, I can be much more helpful to that person in wow. terms of not just the use of the car, but a whole a broader range of things. There's a company, you may be familiar, Sense Networks, a spin out from MIT Media Labs. One of the things they do is they have an application on the iPhone that tracks your movements. You give it permission, it's an opt-in thing, you give it permission, it'll just watch for a few weeks where you go, how often you go, how, how much time you spend. And based on that, after a few weeks, it'll say, you know, by the way, you're a member of this tribe. There, Interesting. There are a group of people just like you in Who terms do similar of their movements. Things, yes. right. And then it starts to give you recommendations. You know, there are members of your tribe who have been to this restaurant a lot, and they keep going back, and you, you haven't been at all. You know, you might want to give it a try. So it's that kind of opportunity, back to the car example, if I've got the visibility on the car now, I could start to give very interesting advice to the people who are using the cars and become more of the trusted advisor. Well, you know, and that now becomes more and more possible because of the connected car and so on. Yeah. I, yeah. In fact, I'm speaking at the uh, LA Auto Show on the future of the connected car. Ah, interesting. Uh, so, you know, that's a really interesting example. So one of the questions that always comes up, of course, in this world, how do you deal with privacy, right? Yeah. If Ford is going to know everything I do with my car, <laughs> do I really want them to know that? I mean, <laughs> how, how do they make this transition to this world of transparency yeah. where I reveal myself in such a way that services can be configured around me? Great question. I think at the end of the day, our, my belief based on the research I've done is most of us are not privacy absolutists. If, if we believe we're getting value in return for the information we provide, we will gladly provide it to get that value. My favorite example is getting on board a plane. I insist that they take my information about my flight because I'm going to get some frequent flyer miles from it. Long story short, I believe that the what's going to evolve here, and this was actually a topic of another book I wrote almost 15 years ago called Net Worth. Remember that too? Which was the opportunity to, as part of this trusted advisor, customer advisor role, is to become your agent in terms of capturing the data about you and then negotiating with the various people who want access to the data to say under what terms you'll provide that, that access. Um, you know, some people focus on the monetary value, I'm going to get paid for access. I think the real value that the, the individual is going to get is something that's tailored to their particular needs in return for the providing that information. And part of the negotiation is making sure that the vendors taking the information are constrained in terms of not making it available to third parties except under particular conditions pre-specified. So I think there's a role for this customer agent, trusted agent, to actually manage your data on your behalf and make sure that it's being provided to those who can offer the most value in return. Is anybody actually doing that right now? There are some startups in the area, but uh, the, the problem is there have been waves of startups. The first wave viewed it as a, the privacy absolutist, that the role of this group was to make sure nobody else had access to your data. Most people don't want that. 
Second wave was to say, okay, there's cash value in the data. We'll negotiate to get you cash. Those failed. Now we're starting to see some who do provide this focus on convenience and trusted recommendations based on the data and starting to give access to the data on pre predefined terms to other parties. So. Well, that's really great. Thank you, John. A it's pleasure. It's a great pleasure having you. And, and for all of our viewers, I want you to know that tomorrow, John and I will be carrying on this conversation at one of the executive roundtables tomorrow morning, and you'll have an opportunity to explore this in greater depth. Where can they go to get more information, John, quickly? They can go. Uh, unfortunately, the website is a long URL. Just Google Deloitte plus Center for the Edge, and you'll get to our website. All our research is freely available on that website. Great. Thanks a lot, John. Hey, thank great you. Great to have you here. Absolutely.